Thank you, Dr. Hart. I have no conflicts uh, related to this talk. And so to brief overview, we'll, we'll talk uh, through the background, uh, some classification, risk factors, and preventive techniques, and then management uh, once you or if you get uh, PJK or PJF. And you know, starting off from I'm fairly early in practice, and this, uh, you know, although I knew that PJK and PJF existed, this really caught me by surprise when I started having patients that, that had this. And it's certainly been one of the toughest complications to, to learn to deal with because um, it's in part a bit unpredictable. But um, you know, about 30 years ago, there was first descriptions by uh, Tom, Lowe, Tom Lowe and group about um, the uh, failure of the junction, uh, usually over the top and uh, and or um, at the bottom of a, a stiff construct. And this uh, makes sense when you think about uh, the how the stress can be um, concentrated at the, the the end of a very rigid metal construct into a soft, uh, more uh, soft bone and soft tissue envelope. And there's been several definitions uh, throughout the literature for a PJK and PJF, but PJK is more, more, most commonly defined as a increase in the uh, proximal junctional angle between the bottom of the, the UIV, the upper instrument vertebrae, and then uh, two above that of greater than 10 degrees. And uh, this paper by Gladys and um, some of the WashU folks was uh, one of the first that defined this. And um, this is a depiction of how it's measured. You can see it's kind of standard Cobb technique in that angle, the difference between your preoperative angle and uh, postoperative angle at your time point defines that uh, and <clears throat> 10 degrees uh, being uh, the most typical threshold. But uh, there are several papers throughout the literature will use other thresholds. Uh, this is uh, one. Um, by Hegelson that used uh, 15 degrees, and they measured the UAV, the top of the UAV, UAV plus one. So as you're reading th through the papers, it's important to be aware of what uh, what is being defined as uh, PJ, PJK. And um, uh, Keith Bridwell has, in some of his papers, defined uh, more clinically significant PJK as uh, 20 degrees. Um, the more severe cases of uh, PJK um, be, became termed a PJF, um, proximal junctional failure. And in several piece, uh, works that uh, Dr. Hart has done and others, um, the uh, classification system that we'll go through through uh, in a bit uh, further defines uh, what uh, PJF uh, entails. But in general, it's a fracture of the UIV, UIV plus one. There's posteosteal ligament disruption and uh, or instrument pullout at the UIV. <clears throat> PJK is, uh, is, is, is fairly common. Um, the incidence and the prevalence vary widely in uh, papers from as low as 5% up to 62%. But most studies nowadays uh, would agree that it's, it's somewhere probably around uh, 20 to 40%. And as our techniques improve and our knowledge of this problem improves, I think these are starting to, to slow down a bit. Um, and the, the prevalence of the PJF is um, corresponding a little bit lower. The uh, a PJK is typically a problem or more early on, as up to two thirds or more of uh, the people that will have it will, will have it within the first three months. Um, you know, in my, in my experience, most of uh, the patients that I've had it have been you know relatively early within the first month or two or three, and uh, those with PJ. Um, um, and, and that number just keeps going up to 80% in, in 18 months. And likewise, PJF is also a, a typically a problem that, that evolves in the first year, in the first uh, several months. Um, classification of uh, PJK and PJF is important because, as you can see, this the spectrum of varies quite a bit. Um, you know, some of these uh, cases obviously just require observation, and some may need treatment. And so. Um, just wanted to throw a case in, in, in here to, uh, to keep things interesting. But this is a, a, one of the first, um, uh, our patient I did about eight months ago, eight, nine months ago, who uh, presented with, uh, obviously, this deformity. She had seven previous surgeries. Um, uh, we'll go through some of the risk factors that the that has led to her to develop this. But it, probably the biggest risk factor was improper level selection. Um, and poor kind of uh, poor instrumentation technique and level uh, level choice, but um, you know her her problem um, was it was mainly instrument pullout, and so this be categorized as PJF, and uh, eventually revised her up to, to T2. Um, but uh, <clears throat> the first uh, classification for PJF came uh, from uh, Yagi and uh, Boachi 
and, um, and their study group, and then uh, Hart and the ISSG prevented, uh, presented a revised uh, classification system. Uh, Yegi's classification system uh, was based um, into three types, and then further classified according to the degree of the, the PJA. And most of failures were this, most uh, PJKs were the uh, the two ends, or the bony compression fracture or failure, and then um, significant uh, kyphosis that developed uh, um, because of that compression fracture. Uh, one of the downsides, and then they later added on the spondylolisthesis uh, section, but this provided a little bit less uh, guidance for management. And then the heart uh, ISSG um, um, scale really assessed six different components that, uh, that the clinician should pay attention to and look at when you have a patient that develops PJK, and these include neurologic deficit, pain, uh, any instrumentation issues, the uh, change in the uh, kyphosis and the uh, uh, PLC integrity, where, where is our fracture, and um, where, where, what is the level of the UIV. And you can see there's a scoring method. Uh, um, you, know, you can just add up uh, essentially the score. There isn't necessarily thresholds for when you have to act, like uh, the TLIX or the slick classification and trauma, but in part, the, those studies inspired uh, the development of the scale to help with management. And in a further study that came out recently, uh, they uh, used um, a pooled data of uh, hundreds of patients to essentially score them and then to look at both their, their functional outcomes based on their score and then their need for revision. In this particular table, is uh, the incidence of revision. As you can see, your score goes up. You uh, near 90, 100% revision rates uh, for these um, people. So you, you, know, you can see around six or eight is when you really start having um, the revisions go up. So risk factors for P PJK are, are, are fairly vast, and they're a bit difficult to uh, categorize. People have done it uh, based on just patient characteristics, curve characteristics, radiographic issues, biologic issues. Um, you know, Some have tried to uh, have, have talked about what's modifiable, non-modifiable. This is not necessarily the optimal uh, category or way to do it, but I, um, I just tried to, to compartmentalize them for, for everyone. And so um, suggested mechanisms of, uh, of PJK, PJF, in, includes aggressive dissection, disruption of the posterior ligamentous complex, facet capsules, uh, ligaments at the, um, at the top of the construct. Um, you know, improper uh, uh, UIV uh, or even LIV uh, um, uh, selection, um, age, um, you know, not paying attention to patients' at age, and kind of what, what needs to be their global alignment. Um, some, you know, th these are kind of more or less modifiable things, but uh, the, the concept of you know, overcorrecting someone's spine, if someone has, th these have been demonstrated risk factors in multiple studies that uh, people that have preoperatively very severe SVAs, very severe thoracic kyphosis, and you bring them way back uh, even to a uh, more normalized SVA, which you know, we, we traditionally thought of as of zero, um, these patients uh, are at a bit more risk for um, having PJK. And as uh, the ISSG and other groups continue to do work on age adjustment, um, sagittal alignment, it's become clear that someone who's 70 or 80 uh, ideal SVA may not be zero, and may need to stop short of that. And considering the global spine alignment is uh, is key at really balancing, you know, how much correction you want, not leave them too forward, but not necessarily bring them back to zero or even negative, because their chances of PJ uh, K or F may be a little bit higher. Um, combined, uh, doing anterior and posterior effusions have been demonstrated to be a risk factor, as it likely stiffens the uh, the spine, increases that rigidity uh, difference between the uninstrumented and instrumented spine. Uh, UAV LAV choice in multiple series. There is um, uh, the, the stopping at around T uh, T9 T10 um, has the highest risk, and then going up, um, the second highest risk is you know stopping the upper thoracic uh, spine. Um, concept of not stopping where that proximal dunctal angle is greater than five degrees is an important one. And uh, while it's often necessary, stopping at the sacral, um, sacrum and pelvis uh, is, uh, there's significantly higher risk of PJK. Cases that were stopped at L5 or L4, um, there's still that moment, you still have that, that movement um, and sort of that stiff, um, is, you're not putting all that moment arm and transferring up to the top of the construct. And there's been, uh, so we talked about the disruption of the uh, soft tissues, uh, high uh, BMI, and uh, rod choices, and uh, construct rigidity at the very top has implications. Um, here's just another case uh, that um, I throw in here, and this is a uh, more elderly female, so she's a risk factor of age. She's got a low bone mineral density. Um, that was um, 
borderline uh, osteoporotic and you know within two months after surgery developed this uh, compression uh, fracture at the UAV at T10 and I embraced her after that occurred and been watching her for six months and she's not progressed but um, you know, this is just an example this is a pretty benign you know benign you know relatively mild to, to mild deformity um, but uh, you know, this lady in particular had uh, several risk factors, and her thoracic kyphosis and is uh, a bit, um, you know, on the higher end, also kind of leading to uh, to that, that risk for fracture. Um, things that are less modifiable are older age. There's been multiple studies that show that uh, as you age, you're older than 55, your risk of PJK go up dramatically. Low bone mineral density, osteoporosis, is, um, especially, um, <clears throat> and um, you know, the other things we've, we've discussed. The uh, type of instrumentation used at the UIV is also implicated in uh, risk factor for uh, PJK. You know, I know uh, um, I've been typically using uh, screws at the top, although I've started to move more towards hooks. I know uh, Dr. Gupta here, I mean, you, you uh, used uh, TP hooks and get definitely gone to that as I've seen more uh, PJK. And the, this is more of a, a softer variable as, as the uh, p-values in these studies aren't quite as uh, significant for hooks versus screws, but there definitely seems to be a difference. Um, and then uh, choice of uh, UIV um, uh, has uh, been implicated. And this is one of the uh, meta-analyses, uh, many, many analyses that have been done um, with the last 10 years worth of literature that have uh, pointed out that advanced age, uh, sacrum, uh, fusion of the sacrum, uh, high uh, thoracic kyphosis, and low, low mineral, min, bone mineral density, and uh, high SVA all are risk factors. Um, uh, this is a newer paper that I, that I found. Uh, it was, it's fairly interesting. Uh, it's, once in a while, I'll put in bicortical screws, but uh, this um, in this series, they found that uh, putting bicortical screws, especially at the UIV, is a risk factor, and this makes sense. And, and, and uh, when I think about some of the failures I've had at the upper uh, junction, and especially if you're putting in screws and fenestrating the vertebral body or having to redirect a screw, you're, you're compromising the, uh, the stability of that uh, vertebral body. And uh, especially when you, when you go by a cortical, you're violating the cortex. And, and uh, this series shows that there's a higher rate of fracture when those screws are bicortical. Um, there was a recent paper that came out of uh, ISSG that evaluated 510 patients and actually built like, a risk stratification algorithm, which I thought was interesting. I, I don't know if they've developed the actual digital calculator yet, but at least in this paper, they, um, they used uh, these 137 people that have had uh, PJ, uh, significant PJK or PJF to develop this uh, algorithm and ordered each variable as in its order of importance. And you can see age, advanced age, um, LIV being uh, the sacrum, uh, um, pretty extreme uh, SVAs, um, implant choice, uh, UAV choice level, and uh, pelvic tilt and uh, uh, PILL mismatch were all um, significant uh, variables within the, their equation, um, kind of in that rank. So it gives you a sense of the potential impact um, that each of those may have. So uh, preventive techniques, now Dr. Hart will be getting into this more during the lab, a portion that will follow immediately, and he'll talk to you about some of the posterior comma augmentation, so I'll, I'll touch over it briefly. But soft tissue consideration is, is, has become critical. Um, you know, I personally will be very uh, um, careful up at the UIV and leave the interspinous, supraspinous ligament for um, two levels, you know, one or two levels below the, the UIV. Be very careful about disrupting the facets and kind of taking minimal muscle um, uh, off uh, just enough to get a screw or, or TP hook. Um, some of the posterior column augmentation techniques that, that he'll go through next, which include this rib fixation. I, I haven't done this, and uh, but I know some people do. The evidence is, is, is there's a small amount of evidence uh, for that. Spinous process augmentation, you know, either with sublaminar uh, tape or um, merceline tape uh, wires that, that's placed at the junction of the Spinous process and lamina have been described and used. Um, in, in my training, I didn't uh, really observe it uh, at WashU or, or Columbia. And the use of uh, um, hooks, and that's something that, that some people have gone more to, although they have problems in themselves. Um, and then this concept of laying in rods is, uh, is an important one. I typically do my adult redu uh, redu rod reductions from distal to proximal and will in situ bend the rods. So they essentially just lay into the UIV uh, levels um, you know, with in situ benders. And then sometimes I'll use these uh, pre contoured uh, standard rods that will have some of that in, and then I can 
and I just recontour those even more just to fit in uh, perfectly to avoid that up, upper uh, attention on the upper upper levels. And then this this concept of bio, use of biologics, you know, i.e. Uh, teriparatide, uh, Forteo, has become uh, more recognized to help treat people that are marginally um, uh, osteoporotic and, osteo and full, full osteoporotic. So this is uh, some pictures from the lab that, uh, that Dr. Hart will go through his techniques of doing this uh, UAV plus one rib fixation. Um, and, um, and, and he'll explain to you kind of why he does it, and these are just some of the factors that I'll let him to, let him describe. Um, and his uh, experience, and these, this data is a little, a little bit old, but uh, he's had uh, 26, over 26 patients that he's done um, some kind of rib fixation with, sometimes with rigid constructs, sometimes with more soft uh, uh, um, tape type constructs. And, his uh, results have been, I mean, he still has gotten PJK and PJF, but uh, as of the time he gave this, gave me this data, he had no uh, revisions for that. Certainly pulmonary complications when you're putting fixation on the ribs uh, can develop. And this is one of his cases. Um, see, this, uh, this uh, patient has had multiple previous surgeries, uh, osteopenic, um, um, very, very uh, significant sagittal imbalance. Um, obese uh, and, and, and older, and so she's got multiple, multiple risk factors for PJK, PJF, and uh, he did a two-stage um, uh, surgery, revision surgery on her, you know, big posterior, uh, gets most of his reduction um, with posterior fixation, and then uh, did a an anterior uh, uh, VCR, and used this uh, rib fixation with UAV plus two, or plus one. Um, some of the I'll peruse through these fairly quickly, but these are just some of the, the papers that uh, talk about the preventive techniques use of hooks. In this series, there was um, you know 50 patients, uh, roughly half and half, that had hooks versus screws, and the uh, PJK rate out uh, to a year plus was was um, they said, said zero with TP hooks and eight with the uh, pedicle screws, and there was some slight uh, difference in uh, function scores as well, um, mainly because those patients that that uh, got PJK had less. Uh, had less of a uh, outcomes change. And one other uh, technique that I wanted to mention is the cement augmentation. It's not something that I do, um, but I know Dr. Hart has done it and uh, um, it's been uh, popularized out uh, by Cal Kabesh and um, at Johns Hopkins. Um, this is uh, Dr. some of Dr. Hart's early experience with it. Uh, in that uh, doing some uh, uh, vertebral plastic cement augmentation of the UAV uh, plus one and two, um, yeah, he found that, uh, at least back in this paper, almost 10 years old now, that there was a uh, reduction in the development of PJK, uh, secondary collapse. But as they followed these patients out longer, they found that there was higher rates of degenerative changes at the uh, UAV plus one and, and two levels where they did the, um, the cement augmentation. And this is just a very recent uh, paper that uh, it's an e-publication from um, uh, Cal Kabesh's experience in um, more or less just a case series, not much of a control group here, but their experience of 40 plus patients with um, two level cement augmentation, and that there still was development of PJK and PJF. Um, didn't see much of a difference in the outcomes, and um, ultimately, from what he draws from the, the literature, is that cement augmentation may minimize early PJK, but not necessarily long term. Um, a more new, newer concept is uh, aggressively treating um, osteoporosis or osteopenia before you uh, take someone to the operating room. And there's two main ways to treat uh, the osteoporosis. There's more anti-absorption you know, anti med medications, which we've all heard of, the bisphosphonate class, class and then these anabolic drugs that are uh, newer on the market, the uh, teriparatide, uh, which is known as Forteo. And um, some of the early uh, studies on the anti resorptive drugs and more fusion models demonstrate that there are mixed results, that actually fusion rates uh, might be negatively affected, whereas in the an anabolic class, they're um, uh, augmented. And you know, my, my protocol, which is developed you know, on my training, is that those uh, with um, uh, T-scores uh, between, certainly above 2.5, as you march below 2.5, you consider not even operating. Uh, but um, and as Dr. Wagner said previously, every one of his patients with a T-score below 2.5 failed. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's fairly start, start, startling statistic. But um, those people that are in this category, I typically start on um, uh, Forteo three months prior to surgery and will continue at least one, one year afterwards. And Initially, insurance, I mean, insurance companies can be difficult to, at, at, at approving this, but the company has been, at least recently, fairly good about giving um, 
these uh, credits for for people that have spinal deformities. At least in my practice, for four they can get four dollar uh, three month prescriptions of this uh, of this stuff, and so we use that. But getting a bone mineral density in prior spinal deformity surgery is critical, and I do it on everyone above forty. So uh, some of the uh, studies, this, this top study from 2013, um, looked at uh, fusion rates in uh, postmenopausal women, showed a higher fusion rate assessed by CT um, of over over 15% at one year. And then this just came out, in, I think it was in 2016 or 17, where uh, Ye uh, Yegi, um, who uh, he was uh, the one that developed, helped develop that classification, initial classification, started using this on uh, two separate cohorts. You know, I think he had uh, two groups, um, consecutive patients in, in, his, in his case series, where he started giving this. Um, I noticed a difference in, you know, this is a relatively underpowered study. However, he did notice a difference in the fracture rate um, um, of those that got uh, forte versus those that did not. And his protocol was to start right afterwards, right after surgery, and then just continue it. And you can see there's a small difference in a PGK, PJK uh, um, uh, fracture rate, and then the density um, as measured by CT and a couple other different uh, uh, assays uh, was uh, was higher in the um, in the um, uh, the Forteo group. And so, just uh, another case example. This is a lady that had moderate deformity that uh, been dealing with this for years, and um, the thoracic lumbar curvature sagittal balance was not uh, not bad and re you know relatively normal for for someone her age, um, but you know, I took her back uh, to surgery and did a T3 to, to pelvis on her, and um, and it was pretty pr pretty proud of my results. Um, but as I watched her in, in clinic, and you know, the, the film in the middle is uh, when she left the hospital, and then at each subsequent visit, I, you know, I just noticed that uh, her head became more and more forward, and her ACDF plate just helps. Uh, you, know, you can just see the, the plate going more and more horizontal, and so. Um, you know, I got a series, you know, I got MRs and a CT, worked this up, and, you know, she had a compression fracture at the UIV um, and continued to go forward. And, you know, she wasn't, frankly, myelopathic, uh, but the um, it was convincing enough to me. And, and I braced her afterwards and it, that, that she was not going to recover from this, and so I extended her up uh, to a C4. She had a previous C4-5 fusion, but um, this was... Uh, you know, when you start um, um, experiencing this, it's it's pretty pretty hard to deal with. When I was, you know, someone goes from a you know moderate as deformity now fuse up to C4 because of uh, PJF. So and she, her risk factors, you know, low bone mineral density, advanced age. I gave her she was I probably gave her a little I mean, a little bit more lumbar low doses and increased her thoracic kyphosis. And so and then of course you screws to the top level. Um, I don't remember struggling getting those in, but certainly you know big screws, soft bone. Uh, you can have that fracture. So um, recognition of uh, when someone has PJK and PJF is you know, done radiographically, but by symptoms, they may be asymptomatic. Like some people are don't even notice it, but it's important, obviously, to follow them uh, very closely as uh, they can uh, they can progress and then develop more severe um, uh, compression or subluxation that can lead to myelopathy and spinal cord injury. And I know in uh, you know Keith Bridwell's series uh, that uh, they had his NIH study, they had several pa they had at least one or two patients that were paralyzed from uh, PJF um, that had falls and then uh, um, became uh, came paralyzed. Um, and so that's not and there's certainly case reports of that. And so uh, following that, uh, following it closely is very important. And once someone gets PJF, as um, um, Bob Hart's data and ISSG data shows, there's a very high chance that they'll need a revision surgery. Um, and uh, the main point in, in following these patients is, is watching their exam uh, for a development of myelopathy or cord impingement. And then if there's any, uh, any if they haven't gotten a bone mineral density in treating their uh, fracture or uh, um, with bracing and, and biologics is, is important. Um, and uh, this is just my, my, my technique that I learned uh, in, in part in fellowship, um, is to uh, put on a halo hyper and then um, have the uh, pins uh, uh, more prominent and then use this um, the plastic board that's wrapped in a towel or, and uh, a coban and you can provide a posterior vector uh, of the neck head and neck and then you actually then pull uh, on the back of the halo with 15 uh, pounds of traction or so to then uh, um, flex for that hyperextended uh, upper um, upper c-spine kind of drive the uh, 
the um, the P, the PJF back. Um, you know, obviously doing being being conscious of you know what your how, how compress your cord is and etc. But this makes it a bit easier. Um, um, you know, at least in, in my short experience, to do these revisions. And whether you need to do a decompression uh, osteotomy really depends on how rigid, how long this has gone, and what the deformity looks like. And then in, in closing, um, in most studies uh, that have looked, looked at the development of PJK and PJF will demonstrate that uh, patients that develop and have lower outcomes, and that, ma that makes sense. Obviously, they're having to go undergo reoperation, more intense imaging, more intense follow-up is more costly. And this graph is just one of the many in this uh, recent uh, update uh, by Lau and Hart and ISSG and, and others from the, uh, the SRS uh, study group um, that looked at uh, development of PJ, uh, clinically assumed PJK and PJF and its impact on, uh, on outcomes based on his on, on that scoring system, and as you can see, this is just the ODI that um, your as your score goes up, uh, your outcomes go down, and so there's a clear correlation between development of um, PJK BJF and your and your outcomes. So, in conclusion, advances in the uh, surgical technology that Dr. Wagner discussed has allowed us to do really revolutionize the treatment for adult deformity, and um, it's allowed us to do very aggressive uh, realignments. But uh, as a consequence of that, there's been uh, kind of a new complication over the last 30 years that's been um, um, kind of peaked in prevalence, and that's the PJK and PJF. And now we're starting to recognize that there's meticulous preoperative and perioperative. Uh, techniques that we can use to try and minimize that incidence. It's not been solved completely, but it's certainly something that I think we're getting better at, and, um, and Dr. Hart will go through some of his preventive techniques uh, to follow. Thank you.